Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan the Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? Listen, I wanted to go over a topic that a lot of people have asked me about, and that is how boomerangs work. I know it's not a very complex topic, but they have a lot of special things hidden inside of them. A lot of things people, hey, how does that work? Hey, how does that do that? Ah, yeah, I guess I've never thought about that before. And, uh... It is quite fascinating. They are quite uh, some ingenious little complex components in there. And uh, I'm going to have some extra special help today of using CAD, which I think you're really going to like. So let's get into it. Now get ready. Here we go. So again, thank you for coming back and watching another video. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate everyone that shows up every time to watch videos. I love looking at comments and stuff down below, so make sure you leave something down there. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, today's video, I'm talking about boomerangs and how do they work. I know I'm going to get a ton of questions on this subject because I am only going to cover one type of boomerang. And this, this these uh, boomerangs are so cumbersome to work on that uh, I needed to focus on one thing for this video otherwise it was going to be like a four hour video I know people are like yes four hour video I was like no no <laughs> no not four hour video um, so I was going to cover today just the basic boomerang this is a standard sit down cable lift boomerang it is not an inverted boomerang and it is not a giant inverted boomerang okay so i'm just going over the basics the ones vacoma has made i don't know probably up in the 50s right now the one i had was actually number 33. anyone who's worked on a boomerang would tell you they're numbered afterwards it's boomerang and then a number and that's what which production model it was not like a model as in this is a 125 it's like no no like I had Boomerang 33, and then another park got Boomerang 34, and then another park got Boomerang 35, and 36, 37, 38, and so on. These are really remarkable pieces of equipment. Um, when I was talking with Vacoma one time, they said they had made so many of them, and they were so well produced that a lot of times they could actually make at one point in time... <laughs> should say At one point in time they said uh, from the time that the park signed the contract agreeing to purchase the ride uh, the ride was actually built fabricated and ready to be installed in nine months which is super fast and then the installation is hardly anything because there's hardly any footers to them or anything else there and the, the power unit sitting contained in its own little place in the center of the ride uh, so they're very quick to put up. Um, but I think most parks love them because they're a great addition. It's like, hey, you get six inversions off of that thing. Because uh, you get three inversions going forward and three inversions going backwards. The backwards one, that first loop, that pulls some G-force on there. I know the one we had coming off of, uh, coming off of lift two, if you were sitting in the back seat, that back seat pulled almost I think just a hair over five G's that's a lot and it was very fun to ride on I I always enjoyed riding the boomerang that's still one of those things that parks and people say oh you want to ride on a boomerang it's like yeah of course I do because I'm a mechanic so what do I do on a boomerang it's like I judge how well your coach hooks up to lift two that's my thing like let's hear it let's hear it land on lift two I want to hear that thing because you can hear them all across the park, right? Most parks, it, most parks don't pay for the detonating that uh, Vacoma offers, but uh, you could hear them like you hear them running around. You hear that big catch wagon let go, that clunk, clunk. You hear the roller coaster sound running around, running around, and then you hear it come up to lift two, and you get that brrr, pow. It's like, oh yeah, we landed on lift two. There it is. You could hear the whole structure and everything go. Oh. Gosh, I'm getting too old for this. Oh, man. And then the second big pow, which is a chain trough dropping and rolling backwards. So <laughs> it's it's great. Um, so let's talk about these. Let's start in the, let's start at the beginning. Let's start in the station. 
uh, most boomerangs, the station is made by Vacoma, and they actually supply the station, which is very unusual for a lot of rides, unless you're doing with like carnival type traveling rides. Uh, but it is quite unusual because most manufacturers don't make the station, but Vacoma in this case does. They're all that like diamond plate on the floor. Kind of feels like a traveling ride type deal, but that's what it is. The air gates, my favorite part, right? Stay off the air gates. The air gates um, are actually pneumatic operated and they're a very, very fail safe design. It's quite amazing. It's got a pneumatic actuator that pulls both gates open and they use two little angle bars to open the gates on the inside and it's a mounted above the platform so you don't even have to go underneath to work on them which is great just to remove the cover between them awesome um, and then when they close those two little 90 degree back brackets they fold back up and out like that and then at that point you could take all the air away from the pneumatic ram it doesn't need it because when you try to push on those gates it's those two metal T's pushing on each other on the inside. They're mechanically locked in there. So you don't even need the air cylinder at that point. You could take the cylinder out. Those gates will still not open. Very slick design on Vacoma's part. I love it. Um, I've said this other times before. It's like I am very partial to Vacoma rides. They know what they're doing. And they make an excellent ride for the value out there. It's quite amazing. Um, so... Yeah, I do. I do boast a lot about Vacoma stuff, and I also curse curse about them a lot too. I've had those nights before. <laughs> so, start the station. You get in. Depending on what type of train it is, I mean, I can't go over all the train styles that are out there. Um, the most common one these days is the uh, the MK twelve oh ones. The twelve oh ones are a very common train they got up there. Uh, most parks upgraded to a solid steel axle housing um, all billet style that way there's less weld inspection stuff to do because because the nature of the ride they do require a lot of ndt on these things if you're still using the welded axle housings they required ndt twice a year which is pretty much unheard of on anything else but man these rides go through the ringer when it comes to stress so necessary I uh, get in the train, pull the restraints down. They use a single ratchet, uh, sh single ratchet running up the back with two locking paws working as the ratchet closes. And then while you're sitting there, the catch wagon's coming down the lift hill. The catch wagon is a very complex component, and I wanted to demonstrate. I wanted to show you how complex that component is because um, that's, I think, number number one question I get from people when it comes to, like, if you're standing there looking at the boomerang and most people don't really care how much they work, this or that, but it is one thing when you see that catch wagon latch on to the back of the train, um, people do get that feeling. They get that question right off the bat. How does that actually work? Because... Latching mechanisms in general for people are quite like they want to know like how does that work? Because we all want to know how things latch and how things unlatch because If you know anything about rides, they're heavy. That's holding a lot of stress That's holding a lot of weight and it's kind of like what is actually doing that in there um, the catch wagon on the one I worked on we the mechanics um, nicknamed it Oscar that was the name of it. It was called Oscar. Now, at the time, I had mixed stories of where that name came from. At the time, one of the mechanics that worked there, when the ride was installed, his name was Oscar. And we thought, well, there was the concept out there that, oh, it's because his name was Oscar and he was like one of the first mechanics to work on the ride. He just nicknamed that catch wagon Oscar. And you said, okay, I can buy into that. But, you know, think about later, then Oscar became the boss. And it was like, okay, now Oscar is calling all the shots. He's doing everything. Um, so I don't know where it came from, but we also kind of gave it the street name Oscar as well. But when it was why, it's like, because it'll bite you in the ass every time. <laughs> 
They're saying the manager will bite you in the ass every time. It's like, yeah, he might. <laughs> so not sure where that one came from. but um, So let's talk about the catch wagon real quick. Uh, for this, I am going to use CAD. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, we're going to get really cool models and solid works and all this other stuff. It's like, no, no, I'm talking about CAD, cardboard aided design. Thank you very much, whoever that was that gave me that one. I can't, I was, when I was drawing on paper, they said, surprise you don't use CAD and then spelled it out, cardboard aided design. I was like, oh, I'm going to use that sometime. So a treat. I want to build a catch wagon, a rudimentary catch wagon out of cardboard and show you how it works. So let's see how to do this. Get some cardboard ready and you can make a catch wagon at home too. Here we go. Okay, everything's out of the ordinary on this, so you're going to have to, excuse me. So what we have here is our finished boomerang catch wagon. That's right, made completely out of cardboard. This was a fun build to do. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you look at the side of a boomerang catch wagon, this is pretty much how it looks as it comes down the hill. And it's coming up to the train, which would be over here on this side. And then you have the rear axle on the train, which is also a pickup axle. It's a big bar that sits off to the back of the train. And it comes down here. And then it basically finds its way right into the center of the jaw. And then this is where the magic happens. This is where everyone wants to know, how does that thing work? How does it lock? How does it unlock? So you saw me building the parts for this. So here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna take the axle back out and then this would be the side plate cover. This arm, typically you see this arm from the outside, but for the purposes of doing this, <laughs> I, uh, I left it on the inside. So we'll take the top cover plate off. Okay, now here's the inside, right? It's amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. I know what some people are thinking, did this guy just build an entire catch wagon from memory? Yeah, I did actually. <laughs> okay, so this is the body over here. There's not much to this. It's a couple pieces of a big rectangular tubing welded together. And then from here forward, this is what's referred to as the head assembly of the catch wagon. So this is the part that actually bites onto the train once it comes down in here. We lovingly refer to this piece right here as the Pac-Man for obvious reasons. It kind of looks like a Pac-Man. But uh, basically this, uh, let's see, Vacoma calls this a jaw. So this would be the jaw inside there. Now this is a complex rotating piece of, of equipment here. Uh, there are lots of little tiny parts and bearings and bushings, but there are no like uh, static radial bearings on the inside. It is all highly delicate machine surfaces all the way around that the entire claw or jaw Pac-Man sits inside of. So there is a lot of machine work to here. These things require a lot of oil to keep them running fine. And then uh, so... The 
jaw sits inside of the head like this. And then this arm up here that you can see a lot of times as it comes down, this is what's referred to as the hammer because it looks like a hammer. So to look at the jaw a little closer, it's like, well, how does the jaw lock and unlock? Because this is the catch rack as it comes down. It hasn't locked yet. It's still in the up position. So this being the top over here towards me. So <laughs> basically we'll take like, that's why I made these little caps for it. Uh, so cool. You could take it apart and see on the inside. Now, hopefully I could zoom the video in far enough because I'm shooting this really far away. Um, and you could see this. I tried moving it in, so we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully you could see this in the video and stuff because there's a lot of little pieces, parts in here. Um, so, okay, the jaw is in the unlock position right now. And the cam or the, the axle comes in like this. Once it gets down to the inside right here, it pushes on this little button that's sticking out right here. So this little button right here, it's protruding just a little tiny bit. So as it's coming down here, you get in this little guy right here. This is the button. And then towards the back of this assembly right here, you have this guy right here. You say, well, that's a conduit knockout. Shut up. <laughs> For the purposes of this cardboard catch wagon, this is going to be a, it's a ball bearing essentially that's sitting inside there. It's about 25, 30 millimeters in diameter. It's pretty big. And what it is, is that on, on this side right back here that's inside the head, um, this is just a spring pushing on the ball bearing. And this side over here is mechanically bound up. So it has nowhere to push that bearing. So what happens is when the axle comes in, and it finally connects, it pushes on that button right there and pushes the ball bearing out of the way. Not completely, but just a little bit. And then at that point in time, now it's no longer bound because if I reset it here, right here in this position, the ball bearing is actually binding the assembly. The, the jaw is trying to rotate right now under its weight but it can't because that ball bearing is stuck right in between the two. It's stuck between the stationary side. It's stuck between the rotating side. So it can't rotate. And then when you push that mechanism in, when you push that button in at the very inside of the jaw, it finally moves out of the way enough. And that allows the jaw to start rotating. And the jaw will start to rotate to the closed position. Now, at the same time, my awesome cardboard model here, at the same time it rotates down, you now have the hammer, because it will stop right about there, and the hammer will finish and drop in the rest of the way. Now, this is, this is a really cool design. Like, the Coma did an amazing job when they did this, because right now, the hammer assembly, which has a lot of weight to it. I mean, this is all big solid stock bar on there, so the thing's really heavy. Um, that hammer has now essentially locked the jaw in the shut position. Now that axle is stuck inside of there. It can't go anywhere. So now once the jaw is locked on, the catch wagon is free to start lifting. Now this guy is going to lift up once it gets to the very top, there is a cam underneath on the track that's mounted down here in this area. And this hammer has another arm that sits down below that and simply just rides on that cam. As the wheel finds the cam, the wheel pushes the jaw up and or the, the hammer up. As the hammer starts to rise and come away from there. It gets up a little bit and starts pulling on this guy, starts pulling on this arm assembly at the same time. And right as it clears right there, now that the assembly has cleared itself here, there is now nothing holding this jaw. 
and the weight of the train pulling down the track, because remember you're at like a 55 degree angle at this point, the weight of the train is trying to mo rotate this jaw and it's starting to work. But then that cam rides just a little bit further up and it assists and then that jaw is able to rotate all the way back around. And then at this point, the train is free and it the jaw rotates 100% back around and the train suddenly goes. And at that point in time, the ball bearing at the very beginning, this ball bearing, if I can get it, is pushed back into the center and it's waiting there. Now, when the catch wagon comes down for the next cycle, that wheel that's riding on the cam suddenly falls off of that cam again, and the hammer starts to push back down on this guy, and tries to shut the jaw, but it can't because of that ball bearing. It's bound up on that ball bearing again. So at this point in time, the catch wagon's on its way down the lift hill, the jaw is sitting open, ready to accept the next train. Pretty cool, right? I, I thought it was pretty cool. I was actually kind of marveling at myself off the camera there when, uh, when I was done cutting all this out and I put it together out there in the garage. I was just like, I was quite impressed with myself, honestly. I'm like, man, I built pretty much a working catch wagon out of cardboard. <laughs> CAD, cardboard aided design. Thank you. I don't remember who suggested that on one of my videos, but thank you for uh, the uh, term CAD, cardboard aided design. So this is how the catch wagon works on a boomerang. Um, there is another piece that sits off behind here. The cable just attaches via thimble back here. There's nothing to it. It's just a big eyelet with a rod that sits across it. Nothing, nothing major there. No need to explain it. And then there is a pulley car that also sits behind there. And the pulley car is necessary because you don't want to pull the cable at a funky angle. You want it to be more of a straight pull. So you have to get the cable to go down and then up the lift hill. That's what the pulley car is necessary for, a sheave car right there. So yeah. So once again, when it comes down, catch wagon comes down the train, slows down. This guy finally pushes the ball bearing out of the way. And at that point, the jaw starts to rotate. The hammer comes down all the way latches into place just like that and now the axle is captive in there can't go anywhere on the other side the cam pushes the hammer up the hammer comes up and starts to clear and at this point i'm sorry if the assembly is free enough at that point the jaw can just at this point fly open like that and release the train so it's really important to note that with the with the jaw locked in the down position is that the hammer is the piece that makes the mechanical bind and the lock there to prevent it from accidentally opening on the way up. So for some reason the hammer didn't activate all the way and it was sitting down like this, then theoretically as you're lifting the train and the train starts to articulate, this could just accidentally unlock and it could force the claw open and drop the train midway through, which Vacoma planned for that because that's the reason when you clear the station, that's the reason the station brakes close, is just in case the catch wagon accidentally lets go of the train for some reason, uh, it won't make it through, it won't make it through the course without being all the way at the top of the lift hill first. So brakes are applied during that point in time. Really cool, right? I just wanted to show everybody that I thought it'd be something really cool to make for that video. A replica catch wagon made out of cardboard. There you go. Take it home. Put it on the fridge. At this point in the video, if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe down there and let me know what's going on. If you like this type of video, I'll make more. 
Um, I really do appreciate you just coming back and stopping by. If this is your first time here, welcome. If this is the first time you've ever seen something, if this is the first time you've ever seen something made out of cardboard, it's pretty cool, right? It's fun. <laughs> Anyways, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button down there and uh, come back for more, please. All right, that was interesting, right? <laughs> I, I, I could not believe I'm like, oh my gosh, I just made a catch wagon out of cardboard. And I'm sure there are mechanics that are probably watching this right now going, calling people from across the shop. Hey, come here. Check out this guy. He made a catch wagon out of cardboard. It's like, yes, yes, I did. And it was pretty cool, I have to admit. All right, so that catch wagon is now latched onto the back of the train and it's fully, it's bit onto that rear axle now. So now we're ready. Restraints are closed, lock, air gates are shut. Everyone's in their positions. Let's dispatch. At this point, we should probably actually talk about the power plant. How did I get this far and not talk about the power plant? All right, so typically there's a little white box. It's not little, it's actually pretty big. There's a container somewhere. It's typically in the middle of the ride right back there in some area you don't really see. Um, it's always sitting back there making a lot of noise. And this is where the power comes from. This is where the, the ride controls come from. So in this box, there is some very large control cabinets in there filled with relays top to bottom. And that is what is running the ride. On the opposite side of that, there is a hydraulic power control unit. The whole ride, all the motion on the ride, is done by hydraulics. So the hydraulic power unit is pretty much two, three big components on side of there. The first one is the AC motor. It is a delta Y motor, which is a, it's a delta Y start. It uses two different types of starters to get that motor up to speed. It is something ridiculous. It is like a 200 horsepower. It might even be higher than that. It's, it's a really big AC motor that sits in there. And at the end, it's coupled to a hydraulic pump. The hydraulic pump is a very big hydraulic pump. In my opinion, I'm sure we have heavy equipment operators out there. It's like, that thing's small. What the heck? You could put that in the back of the truck. Easy. It was big for what it did, though. Um, it created a very large flow of hydraulic pressure to either side so it was operated by a swash plate which means that the pump could sit there in neutral essentially and not pump any oil at all or it could sit there if you apply pressure to one side of the swash plate it would start uh, producing positive pressure on port a and suction on port b and then if you move the swash plate to other the other way it would now pump pressure to port b and suction on port a that's what allows things to reverse and change direction out there. Um, so you had the, the motor, the hydraulic pump, and then at the end of that, there was a very large spool valve. The valve was literally about three and a half, four feet in length, pretty good size. And this was the actual switch. This was the valve that switched between lift one and lift two. And that took all the hydraulic flow and moved it between the two lifts. So, really big stuff. Uh, the system typically ran at about, under full load, it ran about 300 bar. I've seen it go up to about as high as 415 bar, which is a lot. And by the way, it gets up to 415 bar right before it blows the electrical fuses to the motor when it deadheads. Yeah, there's, I've spent a lot of time troubleshooting this stuff, so when it deadheads, it's really scary because you have big hydraulic lines that you start to wonder if they are going to rupture. And you might, like, hydraulics are really nasty things. You can get cut in half if a line ruptures, so it's not fun when it starts misbehaving because you really get the fear of God put into you sometimes. Um... But yes, yeah, so that guy's on spinning. It's ramped up. So we hit the dispatch button now. And now what it does is it's already selected to lift one. That big spool valve back there is on lift one. So now the control system starts turning that swash plate on the pump. 
and now the pump starts creating positive pressure and now it goes back over to a winch drum underneath the lift. Vacoma got their start with cranes. So Vacoma is used to building cranes. So what they did is they simply just used a crane winch unit at the base of lift number one. That is what does lifting because you think about it, it's like, wow, it's got to pick that whole roller coaster train up. It has to pick that whole roller coaster train up at a 55 degree angle, which means it's not carrying the full weight of the train. It's not picking it vertically up. But if you think about it, hydraulic winch patch packages on cranes and stuff like that, a Vacoma train that like MK1201 trains, they only weigh like seven or eight tons. They're not much of anything. In the grand scheme of things, when you pick weight and stuff like that, seven tons, eight tons is nothing. That's little tiny stuff. So Vacoma didn't have to try very hard to get a winch package to put in there. The thing that they did have to try for was speed and control. That's what they really wanted to make sure they had when there was speed and control. So that's what caused the winch to be oversized, which caused it to be a, some sort of special thing. So you typically have on the side of the winch, you have a hydraulic motor that's on the side. And, you know, you have a hydraulic pump that's turned by an electric motor. But if that pump turns another motor, it's just a pump at that point in time. But, I mean, if it turns another pump with nothing else, that's a motor at that point in time. It's kind of the same thing because hydraulics just do the same thing on both sides. Anyways, that guy goes into a planetary reduction drive. Planetary reduction drive is the big sun wheel with smaller planets moving around it. So it's a very large, large, large gear reduction. So that pump can run at 1,000 RPM, and on the other side, you're getting out like 100 RPM, right? Uh, so it's a very large reduction, which means you have a massive amount of torque. That planetary drive has gears on the inside which mount to that big spool where all the cable was wrapped around it. Now that cable is nice uh, I think it's 22 millimeter cable. It's not too thick but that cable goes from that winch drum down at the bottom all the way up to the top of the lift hill around a sheave back down and underneath a sheave car to the catch wagon. So remember those lifts on the boomerang are curved. All right. We'll get our uh we'll get our paper here out where you can see that hopefully. Hopefully I can see it. <laughs> okay, so here's a lift basically. Here is our drum down here where the cable is spooled up around it and the cable goes all the way up and over the sheave at the top there's a catch wagon at the bottom now we can't do this we can't connect that top sheave straight to the bottom because you're not trying to pull the train this way you have to pull the train this way first so what did they do as part of the catch wagon, they built a what's called a sheave car, which just sits right behind it. The sheave car is nothing more than a sheave. It's a pulley. It's a wheel that sits on the track. And it separates because it sits right behind the catch wagon, but it's got two little stops that hang off to the side, and there's two stops welded on the track. So it allows the train, the catch wagon, is allowed to safely pass those stops, but the sheave car little too wide for it it stops right there so what you end up getting is you get the sheave car sits right there and now what you have now what you have is this that cable now goes underneath the sheave car up to the top so now when that cable is told to spool up, it's now pulling the train at more of a straight angle out of the station. And then once it gets the sheave car right there, it simply just bottoms up against the catch wagon and the entire assembly is pulled to the top of the lift hill. 
Okay, on the way up, as soon as we clear the station, as soon as the nose of the train clears the station, we close the brakes back. That is necessary because at any point in time, if for some reason that catch wagon lets go of that train, Vacoma says it cannot go through the rest of that track. There's not enough energy. It will valley. It will stick itself somewhere. So they say, we don't want that to happen. So just in case it accidentally does let go, the brakes are closed. So, and we've done penetration testing before. It's kind of scary because if it breaks all the way through and gets up into that Cobra roll up there, um, it's going to be a long day picking that, you know, have to come along the train backwards into the station. So don't like doing it, but yeah, we do do penetration testing on the brakes to ensure that they can hold. Um, so brakes shut, you're on your way up that lift hill. You're doing nothing but sitting there. The hydraulics are running, running. they're humming. The winch drum is just sitting there nicely, spooling its cable back up, winding up closer to the top. Once you hit a certain set of proxes up towards the top, Vacoma always does two proxes for the same thing. There are two flags, one in the rear of the train on the right side, one in the front of the train on the left side. So they're opposite ends of each other. Um, you pass the proxes at pretty much the same time, both proxes, and it tells the station brakes to release. Because now the now Vacoma said, okay, the train is high enough to make it all the way around. So the brakes open up, and then the winch drum starts to slow because it knows it's reaching that unlock cam at the very top. So it slows, it slows, it slows, and then the unlock wheel on that catch wagon rolls over the cam. It releases. The train starts going. While the train is accelerating down the lift hill, that catch wagon is still being pulled up just a little bit further and then it hits another prox and it stops right there shortly after the train releases and then at that point in time we said okay catch wagon is stopped it's not too high because it has an over limit switch that will shut everything off so it says okay catch wagon stopped now it gives the hydraulics time to slow back down and come to a stop which is only like about a second and a half that's it and then it says, okay, that big spool valve down there says, okay, go ahead, switch to lift number two. So it switches to lift number two. And now it's sitting there, okay, what do I do? Now it says, okay, after a couple seconds, just manual timers all running this stuff, after a couple seconds, go ahead and start lift two. So what's it do? It applies pressure to its hydraulic brake that opens the hydraulic brake on the motor up there. And then it starts to amplify the swash plate up there and starts to run that pressure up and that chain starts to turn and it starts getting faster and faster and faster and faster until it's up to the speed where the manufacturer set it or the park set it. Um, and this is not, it's not a great thing. There is a speed that the chain is supposed to be. There's a certain RPM or feet per second that they want the thing running at. We've honestly tried it faster. We've tried it slower doesn't make a hill of beans difference either way except for how long you sit on lift two that's about it it's not really a big deal okay so that thing's turning and it's waiting for the train here comes the train through the loop now this is not like some of their other models where the speed adjusts itself according to the speed of the train coming in not like that at all this is just one speed and done so it goes through the safety brakes which are open at the bottom of lift two and then it goes up and the chain dog lands on top of lift two. Now, a question I get a lot is how does lift two work? It's like, what do you mean? How does lift two work? I don't understand the question. And they say, well, it goes up. Yeah. And then the train just suddenly goes backwards. How does it do that? Oh, 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 okay. I got what you're saying. All right. All right, so we go up. As soon as we go past all the brakes, as soon as we're past the safety brakes at the bottom of lift two, they shut because now the train is passed 
And now anything that happens, whether if the chain dog doesn't latch on or whatever else, they want those safety brakes closed until when? Until the train's all the way up at the very top of the lift again. Okay, so now we're going to latch on to lift two. And you know what? It's time for more cardboard. Let's show you how this is done with more cardboard. Here we go. This will be another good point in time use for a another cardboard trait. This is my makeshift lift two. Let's see if we can, let's use this side. Here we go. Makeshift lift two. If you could see that. Ooh, nice. This is my, uh, my chain that I drew onto the cardboard right there. So this is the chain trough up here. This will be your track and structure down here and train direction is gonna be going this way for the sake of this cardboard video. And uh, this was a question I got. It was, hey, how does lift two drop? So I'm gonna be showing you this here. It might take me a minute to put this together, so bear with me. Okay, <laughs> uh, I think this will work. <laughs> uh, get my money's worth out of this one. All right, so <laughs> here is an example of lift two. You have the structure below, you have the chain trough right here, and then up above is my makeshift drawn on Sharpie chain not to uh, any sort of amusement standards here, but uh, there it is. So the train would be going up this way. So how do we land on lift two? So we take the train and we go up along and we use a little chain dog to latch on, right? We go right up here, we go click, 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 click. Right around here, the chain dog runs out of energy and jams back in there. Now it's a self-energizing chain dog. In fact, I had, I was like, oh, maybe I should make some. I did. I never used them, but I have it right here. Um, this is kind of really a really crude, crude replica of more of like what a boomerang chain dog would look like, like this guy right here. So it would come up, and as it hits the chain, it would hit and go and smack over that chain and then eventually it would find it would lose energy and can't make the next link and then it would suddenly roll back in and drop down like for this guy here would you know you'd have it basically come and go past this one fall down and then it wouldn't make the next one so it would come backwards and land on that guy and then you would have the chain dog fully engaged onto that chain link and it would push it up now, how does the train drop off of a lift two? That's the big question. How does it drop off of lift two? Well, the, the easy answer is you simply just take the chain itself and you pull it down really hard. Um, unlike most chain dogs where this bottom lip is actually work, trying to work really hard at holding the chain on the uh, boomerangs, they're not so much there. They're more straight up and down like that. So when you try to pull the chain out, it's actually really simple just to pull the train chain straight down instead of having to like move the dog forward and then take the chain down. So we accomplish that simply by dropping the chain trough. We move it closer from this position right here, we move it closer to the structure all of a sudden. So you have your chain dog right up here, clack, 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 and then it jams onto there. And then once it gets up towards the very top, remember there's two proximity sensors up there. One is the I'm high enough. It's actually measured on both sides of the train. The first set is the I'm high enough. Go ahead and drop the chain trough. The second set right above it is the holy crap. The train is up too high and the chain trough is still not dropped because it should never make that upper sensor. And in that, in that case, if that train ever hits that top prox, 
everything the ride goes into a complete e-stop it shuts off the hydraulic pump closes the brakes everything the ride's like major problem it shuts itself off but for this purpose let's see if we can get this to actually work here once we're up towards the top right there all we do is we use a pneumatic ram underneath the trough and you have these support brackets right here that support the trough going all the way up and then there is, um, let's see if I remember this right, there is three pneumatic rams, which is this is a support lever with basically another cantilever lever off the side of it. There's a pneumatic ram, three of them going up the lift as well. And once a train makes its way up there and hits that first prox, it tells all three rams to energize. Let's see if this works. And it simply drops the trough forward like that. So once it drops the trough forward, then the chain dog here unlatches and it's free to roll back. Now the, the dog, in this case, the dog doesn't drop down more than about a chain's link, a link uh, height. So it's very critical that that's in that area. That way it can lock onto it. But another point is that when the trough drops, it drops about... I don't know, about 150 millimeters, it's not that much. But it also has to clear all those links on the way back down. Because if it were to somehow reach down and grab a link on the way back down, it would pretty much, all it would do, I mean, it wouldn't feel the best in the train itself, but it would pretty much snap the chain dog in half. It would just tear the steel right across the thickest part. And then it just close, goes back down, goes in reverse. And then once a train is back into the station, a lot of times you come back into the station when it stops, that's when you hear a hiss of air come from lift two. That's pneumatic rams pushing the other way and raising the trough back up. Now, when it drops in the first place, the chain is being driven up. The chain stops at the same time the trough drops. So if you actually look at the two, the chain is being constantly held in one position. Oh no, my cardboard chain trough is falling apart. <laughs> oh man. Um, the chain's being held in that one spot. So as it goes up and down like this, it simply just it doesn't do anything. It, it just stays there. It will stay in this position like where my hand is like this. And when it drops, it will come down and just follow like that. So the chain is not actually dropping forward with the trough. The chain is actually staying still. The trough is moving, which just allows train, the chain to go down. Same thing. Chain is right here where my fingers are. And when it goes back up, my hand stays in the same spot as the trough returns to the upper position. And then at that point, it's ready for another cycle. These are monitored in both the up and the down position. There's multiple proxes in the top and lower position throughout the entire thing. And um, there are also, underneath, there are shocks, dampeners placed up through there. If the lift is considered a quiet lift, uh, the dampeners are used, they're indine shocks. They're a gas-loaded spring shock that not only takes the impact, but it absorbs the force as it closes back down to zero. Original, with the, from the ride, uh, from the manufacturer, Vacoma put on there simply just rubber bumpers. That's just, it's just, a, just a chunk of rubber, like a giant pencil eraser that the whole trough would just land on all of a sudden. But if you get kind of like the upgrade, it's not a big upgrade, but if you get a little bit of an upgrade, they put endine shocks up there to absorb that slamming down feature. Okay, pretty simple, right? That's how lift two works, pretty much. Nothing really crazy, crazy or fancy. It's, uh, it's actually much simpler than what most people would think it is. So we've landed on lift two, and now we're going up to the top, 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 top. Like I said, we hit that first prox on the top and bottom side 
we get that first set of proxies which says stop the train, stop the chain rotating, and close the hydraulic brake. That way the, chain, the train does not roll backwards. And at the same time, actuate those pneumatic rams and drop the trough down. And then when it does that, the train starts to roll backwards. Also at the same time, that's the command to open the safety brake. So let's see, we have stop the hydraulic motor uh, from turning the, tr the chain. We have close the hydraulic brake. We have drop the trough and open the safety brakes pretty much all at the same time. All four things happen at once. Stop, brake, drop, brakes open, train rolls backwards. Train rolls backwards, it goes to the track, it does its thing, it comes ripping back through the station again. This is the part that if you run all your stock stuff, the way Vacoma set it up, earlier models like my early number 33, um, this is the part where a lot of experience is needed for fine tuning the system. Because homing the train is a whole different thing. There's not booster motors that push the train into position. There's nothing else. It's all done off of gravity. So if your train rips back through all those brakes and flies up the lift hill and comes in to where there's just like a coach out of the back of the station and nothing else out of the back of the brakes, those brakes will open because the operator has said go ahead and start the homing process by pressing the brake button. Those brakes will open and then the train won't go anywhere because it's all sitting too level. There's not enough of the ass end of the train out the back of the station to get the weight to push the train forward. So the train just sits there. It doesn't do anything. At that point, the ride's officially broken down with people on it. Maintenance has to come out. What's the complicated process here? Well, you stand behind the train and you push it back into the home position. A lot of times you need two people for it, but sometimes you could do it by yourself. Depends on if you ate your Wheaties for the day. Push it back in the home, stop it. It's a very complicated process to make these adjustments next, and there's no real good way of doing it because it's dynamic. It depends on how many people are on, the time of day, the temperature, everything. I mean, our boomerang, we were out there sometimes three or four times a day making brake pressure adjustments. So what you want it to do is you actually want it to stop really hard. You prefer that. So you bring it where it comes backwards out of the station and then only like three coaches go into the front brake and then it stops. Operator hits that button, comes through, starts getting up more and more speed, stops again, and then there's enough of that train hanging out to where when the brakes open up that last time, it gently rolls forward to the home position, and it stops. And it says, okay, restraints release, everybody out. That's ideal, but sometimes it doesn't happen, so mechanics have to go... It's typically under the station. You have to go to the brake assemblies and manually start adjusting pressure up or down depending on which way you want it to go. And it's not something a new guy can do either because the, the pressure has become very finicky. You can get it, you can adjust it and get it to right to run right for a little bit, but then it won't run right in half an hour. And then you can adjust it again, it won't run right again in another half an hour. But a good mechanic that really knows what they're doing and understands the situation, what's happening, they can go out there and make one adjustment once and you won't hear from it again for the rest of the day. Also, in that case, your operators are also good. The ones that are experienced with the ride, they can call up maintenance ahead of time and say, hey, this thing's getting close to undershooting, which is typically what it's called. When it doesn't go in all the way, they call it an undershoot. So this thing's close to undershooting. Can you have someone come out and start adjusting the brake pressures? Absolutely, yes. We will be right out there. We hopefully get that thing before it breaks down completely. That's hard a lot of times when there's, uh, you know, there's not much uh, downtime that day for mechanics. That is, if you're 
the park's malfunctioning all over the place and you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, you don't have much time to stop by those rides for those little nicety calls. And it might be one of those things, yeah, when it breaks down, we'll get there. We'll put it on the list, right? All the other crap that's broken down today. So we'll get there eventually. So that's basic operation of a boomerang. Uh, let's talk about rehab real quick for a boomerang. So what do we do? We pull the trains off. Pretty easy. You just pick those things right off of there, remove the upstops, train comes off. No big deal. Um, we typically take the head of the catch wagon off and bring it back and rework as many of the bearings and bushings as we can. Lots of new stuff. Um, this is not a guaranteed thing. Uh, a lot of parks take the, you know, if it's not broke, don't work on it mentality. Uh, I would say like, oh, I would never do that. But no, I, I did it all the time. If <laughs> rehab would come, what are we doing? The catch wagon it was working great. Don't touch that thing. Um, I did it a couple years. I proactively dug into that thing. We're replacing all the bushings. We're doing all the... We're doing all the uh, actuating head mechanism. We're doing everything on that. It's going to be awesome. It's going to work perfect when we put it back together. Put it back together. We could not get that thing to work for a long time. We ended up machining parts back down. Couldn't get it to work. You know what we ended up doing? We ended up putting the old parts back into it. And then it would work fine. It's like, oh my gosh. So we kind of learned our lesson there. It was like, all right, you can replace parts during the season like one part at a time that way you know if you put that one part in and the thing doesn't work again well you know what one part to tackle now right it's like okay i know i i know i did that one part so i'm going to go back into that one part and figure out what happened in there because that thing's complex to work on um just for the you know you think there would be a bunch of ball bearings inside or something that would help everything rotate smoothly but nope it's all just brass on steel with just a thin layer of oil coating it to help it work it's it's quite touchy um track and structure wise uh, brake linings replace the brake linings if they're worn down uh, safety brakes typically never really have any troubles but you go through and check weld and stuff on, like that on there uh, lift two Measure chain stretch. Typically, you call a manufacturer out to uh, manufacturer of the chain out or a representative out to measure the chain, as an impartial party. Because park go out there every time and be like, chain is good, nothing wrong with that thing. Um, and you get the manufacturer of the the chain out there, and they're like, oh yeah, that's got to be replaced. Uh, did you use it this year? Yep, it's got to be replaced. Then did you take it out of the box? Yep, has to be replaced. Then. You know how that goes. Anytime you bring a manufacturer out, they're like, oh yeah, you should replace that thing. Sounds like a lot of money in our pocket. Um, but if you bring a third party out that really doesn't have any skin in the game for that, they will tell you the chain is within its stretch, it's not within its stretch. And that's just to keep both sides honest, right? That way the park doesn't fudge numbers and the manufacturer just doesn't get a chain sale off the deal. Um, and then chain liner... On lift two takes a pretty big beating. Chain liner is the plastic that sits underneath the chain that allows that chain to slide nice and easy over that. Uh, you know, if you keep chain liner lubricated, 30 weight oil, it, it does a pretty good job by itself. But a lot of times, uh, the just the sheer impact on lift two, especially every time that train lands on lift two, you need to replace liner sometimes, especially in that area. Replace the liner in there. And then on lift one, our park was in the habit of every year the cable got replaced. Whether it looked good, whether it looked bad, didn't matter. We replaced that cable every single year. So that wasn't really a like, oh, inspect it, see if there's any of this. We had a complete cable inspection criteria for it that we used with the ride in operation. But when the ride was brand new to the park they had one of the cables fail before my time this is what i understood cable failed and uh messed up a lot of stuff so it was just the park learned after that you know what regardless of what's happening the cable are they're cheap they're only like i can't remember what it was i think it was like 
$1,000 or something like that for a cable. It's like $1,000, who cares? Replace the cable. Heck, replace the cable every six months. Like, those cables are cheap for what they do. Um, so, it's amazing most parks don't replace them more often, but coming from a park, it's like, I understand. You don't necessarily have the time and energy and people to get out there to replace a cable because they're kind of a bear to replace by themselves. Um, but they're quite cheap for what they are. And then, you know, statistically, anytime you replace anything, it's got a chance for failure. So just the act of working on something could get it to fail more than what it was. Uh, but let's see, it is, you got uh, lift one, lift two, cable, hydraulic system, not much there. Flush and refill the uh, oil, change the filters. It's got about, let's see, I think six filters in there. The hydraulic accumulator on lift two had to get changed every year. That one, <laughs> it's funny, underneath the motor, it literally looks like there's a big metering uh, body on the back of the motor and it literally looks like a hand grenade screwed into the back of the thing um, and that was the accumulator it's got uh, air pressure or nitrogen charge on one side hydraulic fluid on the other side when that thing went bad you almost instantly knew it because when the train would land on lift two it would be just go up there and go brrr, bang and then you hear the hydraulic system just go brrr, and pick back up and start carrying the train again when that hydraulic accumulator was bad you'd hear it go up there bang and then land there it wouldn't move forward anymore the train would just sit there on lift two the hydraulics would be running it'd be putting a ton of pressure to that lift but it would be bypassing up at the top because there was a bypass valve up there it would just be bypassing because the hydraulic accumulator did not absorb that load and push it back into the line. So every time, and I've, we had a handful of them do that, every time that would happen, you know, it's like, okay, once we recovered the train and got the people off of it, um, went up there, unscrewed that accumulator, screwed a new one back on, and it picked right up and we never had any troubles with it again. They would randomly go out and it wasn't something like, oh, yeah, you got to replace it every four months or something. You could leave it on there. Like when I first started working there, we didn't change that thing out for like three or four years. And then after it bit us a couple times or like every year, every year, change it out. And then it still failed intermittently in between here and there. Not sure why. Just did. I mean, it's out in the elements, that sort of stuff. Um My boss's name for the boomerang, he says it was it was a stick. It's like, it's not a boomerang, it's a stick. Because a boomerang comes back. <laughs> so the models of boomerang he was used to working with, he would, they had, like, where I was, we wouldn't have this happen too often, but they would stick the train in the safety brakes all the time, whether it fell off a lift two, like it didn't bite on the chain up there for some reason, so the train fell off a lift two, or operators accidentally e-stopped the ride over there. But they were constantly sticking the train in the safety brakes between uh, lift two and the loop. And there's a recovery winch at the top of lift two. There's a big steel winch up there with a hook. And you can go up there, switch it on. Mechanic has to drag the hook all the way down. You hook it to the front of the train and you pull the train up until it latches onto the chain itself. Undo the hook, wind it back up then start the system back up and the ride carries on as normal. But uh, yeah, it's funny, my boss was like, that's not a boomerang, that's a stick. Because boomerangs come back, that ride does not come back. He didn't have good opinions of it, but uh, at, the at the same time, he knew more than I did about the thing. And uh, we kept ours running really good. Again, it was, it's got its ups, it's got its down, but we, we really had that thing working well, my opinion, completely. Well, I've had fun on this video. We did a lot of stuff. I've used up a lot of cardboard for sure, <laughs> but um, this is the best way I could think of. I have pictures. I have some uh, like exploded diagrams of the catch wagon, but realistically, if you're just sitting there, even on the computer, if I just take the mouse and point to parts, it's, you're really sitting there like, what 
I don't I don't understand. I don't understand. And that was it's not just not just you guys. It's everybody. Like I've had mechanics working on the ride that have never had that jaw part before. And we're sitting there in the shop pointing to all of this stuff. I'm trying to use my hands to explain like it does this and it does that. And they're like, what? what? I don't understand. I don't understand. And it's like, oh, okay, well, let's... And eventually we go out, we tear the jaw apart, and they come back. And I'm like, you understand now? They're like, yeah, I understand. <laughs> okay, so we'll call it a night for now. I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic, and as always, stay off the air gates. Bye.